So, hello, my fellow dream chasers and Disney fans across the world, and welcome to the latest episode of The Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of travel, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney? Today, we go through our last film of the 60s as we continue our road to the Renaissance, which I'm hoping to do over the course of the whole summer, as we take our th trip through the Jungle Book, released in 1967, based on the Rudyard Kipling uh, stories, and it's the it was the first film to be released after Walt Disney himself had passed away uh, the year beforehand. But of course, it wouldn't be The Kingdom of Isolation without me having a guest on board to cover these films. Uh, he was with me for the previous episode involving The Sword and the Stone. It's uh, my striking partner in crime, Mr. Alistair Wayne. Ali, welcome back. Hello. Hello, Fraser. Thanks for having me back. It's great yeah. to be reviewing yet another film with you. <laughs> Yeah, I say, I say, I say, this one is this one's a beloved classic for a lot of uh, long-time Disney fans, especially for especially for uh, us growing up as well. So, no, it is like um, I think you, you asked me, didn't you, before <laughs> to do this one initially? <laughs> I'm allowed. <laughs> oh yeah, I say, I say, we, we just got a just got a bit of distortion there, but uh, okay, but yeah, yeah. No, it's exciting to do this one. Obviously, it's a, a childhood favourite for most yeah. people, so it's a good one to do. Yeah, I say, um, I say, and, uh, I say, I, I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need to try and get this done with uh, within the hour, folks, because uh, Ali's got a meeting meeting in about an hour's time. So, uh, uh, I'm gonna try and get through. I'm gonna try and get through it as uh, quickly as possible, with uh, whilst trying to go through everything in as much detail as I can within the hour. So, so uh, let's not waste any more time. Spoiler alert in place if you haven't seen the film yet. It's on Disney+. Plus. So, without further ado, let's not waste any more time. Let's get started. There we go. Background right out the gate. So, here we go. Intro, my word, and uh, the music right out the gate. I mean, it really does add to the atmosphere of the... Um, of the film, helping you, helping get you immersed in the film right at the gate, and uh, and of course, some, and of course, some of the um, some of the backdrops throughout the opening credit sequence, we're actually going to be seeing those throughout the film. There we go. So yeah, and then we get, and then we get some narration from our, from the from our Black Panther. No, nope, wait, no, nope, not that Black Panther. Rest in peace, Chadwick Boseman. Uh, but uh, Bagheera, voiced by Sebastian Cabot, uh, who's effectively the uh, parental figure, if you will, for Mowgli throughout this film. Uh, he's going about minding his own business, and then here's a baby crying, and he ends up seeing this little um, basket-esque uh, thing that has a, a young Mowgli inside it. Uh, Sebastian Cabot has been in, um, he was actually in the previous episode of The Kingdom of Isolation where he was Lord Ector in The Sword and the Stone, and he's also the narrator in The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, which um, uh, that episode I've already recorded, folks. I'm recording these somewhat out of order just so, uh, j just so I can uh, get them all recorded and I can focus on getting them edited and uploaded in um, order of when the films are released, and you can see all the episodes in the Kingdom of Isolation playlist in the top right of your screen. Um, Bag Bagheera uh, thinks about just leaving Mowgli to his own devices, but um, but but the cute baby, the cute baby sounds though. Come on, I mean, come on, how how can you not be drawn in with the, those those cute baby noises? And uh, I, I mean, the smile on Bagheera's face pretty much says it all and he's like okay i'll see what i can do to look after you and then he takes them to, he takes mowgli to a pack takes him to takes him to a uh takes him to a pack of wolves so let's right so where else are we yeah yeah uh the the mother wolf is um raksha that's the name of the um uh, the mother, the mother wolf, uh, the father wolf is a bit hesitant about looking after um, Mowgli, but he gets convinced, and they they help raise Mowgli uh, for the next ten years. Mowgli is voiced by Bruce Ritherman, one of them, um, one of Wolfgang Ritherman's sons. Wolfgang Ritherman is the director of this film. Uh, but, uh, Bruce was also the voice of uh, Christopher Robin in the Winnie the Pooh short, Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree, which would be used as one of the 
shorts used for one of the segments for the many adventures of uh, Winnie the Pooh. And uh, and there there is some recycled animation at this point in the film where where you've got you've got that moment where the the wolves uh, jump onto uh, Mowgli, start licking his face. That's the same animation that's used in, when the dogs in the castle uh, jump onto Arthur in the uh, Sword and the Stone. Now, I will say this. Uh, one of the main criticisms I have with this film, so I can get it out of the way, is the amount of recycling that they do throughout this film. I mean, it's not as bad as, say, the Phony King of England sequence in Robin Hood, but it, let's say, the recycling is more spread out, if you will. Uh, the recycled uh, sound bites, uh, the recycled animation, um, but, but like I say, the, the amount of recycling that they do that they do in this film is, in a way, somewhat concerning. But, uh, but like I say, that that's like the only major criticism that I have as far as the animation is concerned on my end. So, but um, given the small budget they had for the um, for making this film, it's understandable why they would do as much recycling as they did, especially during this particular era of uh, Disney films. Um, Everything's hunky dory, but then they find out that Shere Khan, who uh, they find out Shere Khan the tiger has uh, returned to the jungle. So the wolves all have a meeting and decide that uh, they need to they need to try and get Mowgli to safety. Bagheera's listening to this meeting, folks, and he's and he he somewhat intervenes. He he gives his he gives his two cents on on the matter, and he thinks right. I know there's a I know there's a man village nearby, so I'll take him there. So, so Bagheera effectively takes up the the mantle of looking after Mowgli until they get him until he gets Mowgli to the man village. But um, Mowgli is somewhat reluctant throughout the film to go back to, to to go to this man village because he's been living in the jungle his entire life effectively. But um, but one, but one thing I did notice is we never really find out what happened to his parents in 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 this particular version of the film. But we but we would get some details on that in the live action remake remake, which I'll touch on in the uh, legacy portion of uh, the scores. So um, the Mowgli and Bagheera they find a tree and they. And they sleep there for the night. And then you have the dawn patrol of Indian elephants. Uh, Colonel Hathi is the leader, voiced by uh, J. Pat O'Malley, which I'm, uh, who I'm pretty sure has been in previous Disney projects as well. If the screen decide, if it, if it all decides to load, uh, yes, he was. He was Tweedledum, Tweedledee, Walrus and the Carpenter, and. Mother Oyster in Alice in Wonderland. Uh, he's been a f he's been in a few TV series uh, at the time. He was in the Twilight Zone. He was also um, he was also Jasper, one of the uh, bumbling sidemen, well, bumbling henchmen for Corel de Ville in 101 Dalmatians. And he was also Colonel, uh, one of the dogs, as well. So he is no stranger to the. Um, he's no stranger to Disney's work, uh, and a couple of years before the Jungle Book was released, he was also uh, a number of characters, the, the pearly drummer, master of hounds, and the huntsman in uh, Mary Poppins, which, um, yes, yes, it does, yes, uh, Mary Poppins does have animation in it, but it's a, it's a hybrid, it combines live action with animation, I'll cover those sort of films at a later date in, like, special episodes, uh, of the Kingdom of Isolation, maybe maybe as an anniversary uh, episode, or maybe, or maybe for like uh, a special, or maybe, or maybe even as like a, a, a Christmas episode. But I've already got this year's Christmas episode sorted in the form of the Muppet Christmas Carol. So there we go. That's 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 this Christmas um, that's this Christmas's episode sorted out. Um, now the songs in this film were composed by the Sherman Brothers, who are of course no strangers to. Uh, Disney's work. Uh, they also composed music for uh, Robin Hood. Uh, no, 
for Mary Poppins. Uh, but one of the songs they did, one, one of the songs, it was um, Terry, it was Terry Gilkeson's uh, The Bare Necessities. That's the only song that wasn't composed by uh, the Sherman Brothers. Uh, and The Bare Necessities ended up being nominated for uh, an Oscar for uh, Best Original Song, which ended up losing out to Talk to the Animals from uh, Dr. Doolittle, which was also released in that same year. But uh, the, Dawn, the Dawn Patrol, um, led by uh, Colonel Haffey, it's, um, yeah, once, once, that, um, once that marching song's out of the way, uh, they end up having this, they, have, they end up having this inspection parade, which very much reminded me of my time in the Boys Brigade, having those inspections at the start of the evening. Uh, at, at the start of the evening, uh, in regard, uh, I was just, just making sure um, uniform was clean, hands were clean, shoes were polished. And I was like, it did remind me of um, uh, my time in the uh, uh, the Boys Brigade. Alistair, were you ever part of the Boys Brigade? Yes, I was, Fraser. Now, yeah, but um, was it? I say, with, I say with, the, with the way they were carrying out the uh, the inspection there. I say, I say, even one point where he actually does the. Um, uh, the effectively uh, army buzz cuts to, to one of the elephants. It's just, <laughs> oh, it's just, it's just, just some of the things that they um, that they do for the inspection here. And uh, and uh, the the junior um, one of the uh, where is he? yeah yeah junior voiced by Clint Howard, uh, who turns out is uh, Colonel Hattie's son. But I think this is a small. I think this is a small plot hole here, but uh, yeah, uh, Colonel Hathi talked about having a Victorian cross in eight uh, in eighty eight, which um which we don't I can only assume would be eighteen eighty eight, but uh, yeah, uh, small issue there as far as the age of the elephants is concerned, especially Colonel Hathi, because um, if he got the Victorian cross in eighteen eighty eight, uh, shouldn't he be like? Uh, dare I say dead because uh, Indian elephants only have like a, an average lifespan of about like 45 years and yes I did research all of this as well so yeah uh, shouldn't A shouldn't Colonel Hathi be dead but also B how old is Junior if Colonel Hathi ended up with a Victorian cross in 1888 but um, ah, hey ho uh, but at the end of the day, um, uh, Bagheera, Bagheera intervenes as uh, Bagheera intervenes before uh, Mowgli ends up uh, in trouble with Colonel Hathi. Uh, explains that explains what's going on, and uh, and Bagheera f firmly stands his ground on uh, getting Mowgli back to uh, the Man Village, and Mowgli's just like, "Nope, I ain't going anywhere," and then. Oh boy, just um, Bagheera trying to just pull at his loin, uh, Bagheera's, uh, Mowgli's uh, loincloth while Mowgli's holding on to some sort of tree. And then part of the material rips off, Bagheera's in the water, and he decides, right, you know what? If you're so happy being in the jungle, fine. Have fun on your own. And. And then at this point, we get introduced to a character whose voice actor just suits the role so well. You've got Baloo voiced by Phil Harris. It would be the first of three consecutive roles for Phil Harris. He would be Thomas O'Malley in The Aristocats, and he would also be uh, Little John in Robin Hood. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be covering those episodes um, soon. Because I'm, I'm I'm trying to get all these episodes uh, done between Jungle Book and uh, Oliver and Company. I'm getting all those films done as quickly as I can, so I can just focus on doing just the Renaissance films throughout um, uh, throughout the summer. And uh, don't worry, Alistair's going to be back with Aladdin, and he's going to have uh, Beth with them. The the Aladdin and Jasmine to uh, to my genie for that uh, particular episode. I say. 
I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm very much looking forward to reliving our childhood and going through these absolute classics uh, for, for us growing up. But um, at this point, um, at this, I say, I say, I say, I'll put it in my notes here. I say Phil Harris just fits the role so well. It's just, just the energy and positivity he brings to the character. It fits his role it fits the character so well. Uh, teaching Mowgli how to um, how to defend himself, and uh, yeah, um, fun fun notes here. Um, he decides. Uh, I, I just thought, yeah, could Mowgli become a future boxer potentially? Uh, I think just Blue teaching him all the basics about get, getting the stance, learning how to throw the punches, and then uh, gives him a little. Um, Gives him a little backhand, and I thought, wow, that's a bit of a cheap shot. Uh, does was it, was it the way it's animated there, though? Mowgli doing numerous cartwheels and then boom into, into the log. Uh, and then once all that's out of the way, my oh boy, <laughs> we get into possibly the most iconic song of the film, which I can't really play in. Which I can't really play too much of because copyright, and we know how very protective Disney can be with their copyrights. Uh, we get, of course, the bare necessities, which I've briefly mentioned. And I say it is just absolutely uh, iconic. I mean, I mean, as far as as far as best Disney songs of all time are concerned, the bare necessities is definitely up there in the top ten. And like I say, this was nominated for an Oscar for uh, Best Original Song, which it lost out to to Dr. Doolittle uh, that year with Talk to the Animals. But once the bare necessities are out of the way, they uh, we have the orangutans come into play. Uh, they end up being very playful. They decide to yeet Mowgli off um, Baloo's stomach, and one, and the orangut one of the orangutans takes um, Mowgli's spot. On the stomach, uh, a fly ends up going onto Baloo's nose, and the orangutan gets the bright idea of getting a big stick, and uh, not 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 just a gentle. He doesn't go for a, a gentle flick of uh, getting the fly off Baloo's nose. He just goes full hammer strike onto his nose, and you're just like, "Wow, that's a bit excessive." And um, I won't really, I won't so much repeat what Baloo says here at this point when he notices it's the orangutan on his stomach rather than Mowgli. But uh, I did put in here, wouldn't this be classed as somewhat uh, offensive? Because on Disney+, Plus, this film actually got flagged for cultural stereotypes, which uh, weren't okay then and weren't okay and aren't okay now. Now, I didn't, I didn't really get what, I didn't really see any, now, of course, us growing up, we don't we don't cotton on to these sort of things as far as like uh, caricatures, stereotypes, and um, all that. But I didn't I didn't really see too much of an issue with it. But uh, given given some of the um, given some of the, I will say given some of the word choice from Baloo, especially you can understand why it would be somewhat flagged. But um, the orangutans they just they just they're just ah, making a mockery of Baloo, effectively. Just, uh, just like, uh, here you go, uh, for one for one instance. Just, yeah, here you go. Here's Mowgli. And then they just yank him back up into the tree. Baloo goes face first into the boulder and just falls clunk. And, and they're just like, uh, they're like, here's some bare necessities. And they just throw like so much fruit from the uh, from the tree. From the trees at him, and then and then one of them ends up on his nose, effectively becoming his new nose. Gets it all off, and then they finish off by getting one of the vines from the um, uh, one of the vines from uh, one of the trees. I say, Blue is 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 still going backwards at this point, folks, and unaware of what's going on behind him, he trips over this vine, falls over the cliff edge, and then this big boulder, boom top of his head and yeah uh Mowgli is taken to see King Louis but um <laughs> oh boy the um 
<laughs> oh boy. Um, Blue trying to get Bagheera's attention, and then Bagheera gets to the uh, the cliff edge, and then uh, just one loud shout right in his face. And uh, yeah, that's uh, I suppose that's one way to get somebody's attention. But uh, <laughs> uh, then we get then we get to th- another iconic scene with "I Want to Be Like You," um, which is sung by. Uh, King Louis, who is voiced by, if I can find him, Louis uh, uh, Louis Prima. Uh, now, interestingly, he was going to be voiced by Louis Armstrong. Yes, folks, that Louis Armstrong, famous for his trumpets and a couple of couple of famous songs from him as well. So, yeah, there is that. But uh, Louis, but Armstrong declined the role and. Trying to trying to remember why he declined it, but um, but yeah, um, we get into we get into the song. Uh, Louis, me, Louis decides to feed Mowgli some. He ends up giving him one banana. But what's better than one banana? Two bananas. What's even better than that? Three bananas. Ah uh, ah uh, ah. Uh. Yes, that's my best count from Sesame Street, folks. Bear with me. Um, so yeah, got enough potassium there, Mowgli. <laughs> Yeah, and oh boy, <laughs> it's um, <laughs> the the interrupts as it, the, the, the orangutan or interrupting monkey throughout this sequence is just absolutely hilarious. He's just like doing everything he can to interview Lou with Louis, uh, be it uh, using his mouth to make it sound like uh, sound like a brass instrument. I would assume a trumpet. And then does a little bit of whistling, and then Louis and Louis is like, "I've had enough." Uh, the leaf that the the interrupting monkey has, um, he smacks it on the top of the monkey's head, and then all I can say is, if you want to learn this song for the stage, folks, yeah, good luck learning the lyrics, especially during this middle portion of the song. <laughs> oh boy! But uh, interestingly, with the with the uh, with the ending of the song, especially uh, the song ending, uh, the ending of the song is also used at the end of the VHS trailer for this film. Because um, it was uh, it, the VHS trailer for the Jungle Book was used in the VHS for Beauty and the Beast uh, over here in the UK. And the end of the uh, the instrumental for the end of "I Want to Be Like You" is used at the end of the is used at the end of that trailer. So just just thought I'd uh, throw that in there. So here we go. We're about halfway through the film already, and we've only been recording for about what twenty minutes or so. I'll yep, yeah. I'll take that as a yes. Yeah, definitely not bad going. Been able to get through the entire. Being able to get through half through, half of the film in about 20 minutes. I was like, not too often I got through it as quickly as this, but of course, there's a reason I need to get through this as quickly because, like I said, like I said earlier, Alistair has a, a meeting to get to, so that's why I'm trying to get through this as quickly as possible. So um classic comedy gag where Blue has a club and he ends up just he goes to he goes to hit one of the orangutans and but ends up uh, whacking the um Ends up whacking the uh, the club on uh, Bagheera's head while they're trying to get Mowgli. But I think it, it, it's a classic comedy gag. You go to hit the enemy and then you end up hitting one of your friends. I mean, absolute classic. I mean, that gag's been used in Looney Tunes. It's been used in Tom and Jerry. It may have even been used in Scooby Doo for all I know. I don't know, but it, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the only couple of couple of things I need to point out. Uh, uh, where where on earth did what on earth was that totem pole thing that the orangutans were using? Because this is where uh, Louis is trying to hold up the uh, this ancient structure, and then Baloo gets this little idea to, for some reason, start tickling King Louis, which puts Louis into some hysterical laughter. The orangutans come along with this totem pole. What? Wh- where did they get it from? What is it exactly? Um, pushes Baloo onto where King Louis was, and then onto the next, and Louis gets shoved onto the next pillar, and then Baloo decides, you know what, have fun, Louis, see you later, 
and then the structure just completely collapses and it ends up in it ends up in Bagheera getting a black eye blue gets a black eye and also a bit of swelling on his face as well uh, after um, after some of the structure fell on their heads but um but once, but once all that's out, but once all that's out of the way, uh, Bagheera and Baloo they end up having a a little little talk together, and they decide uh, Bagheera has to tell um, Bagheera has to tell Baloo that Baloo needs to tell Mowgli that he has to go back to the Man Village, which let's just say doesn't end well. Mowgli runs off, and uh, yeah, they spend a fair bit of time trying to find. Uh, Mowgli, and while all that's happening, we are focusing here for the next few minutes on Shia Khan, and he is voiced brilliantly by George Sanders. Now, I'm not sure if he's been in any other Disney projects previously or afterwards, but we'll see what he has. Complete filmography. Let's have a look. Uh, I don't see his name on anything that looks familiar, um, but he does have he does have a pretty extensive he does have a very extensive resume. Um, so I don't see anything that looks familiar apart from uh, the Jungle Book on his uh, resume. It doesn't look like he's been in any previous Disney projects uh, before or since the Jungle Book came out. So. Uh, if I'm wrong about this, uh, let me know in the comments, folks. But uh, this looks like it's his only dis it's it's his only animated Disney role. But um, let's say he's uh, he's listen. Let's say he's listening to um, let's say he's listening to uh, uh, he, he ends up having a conversation with Car afterwards. Uh, uh, Car does. Car does pop up earlier um, in the film. He's voiced by Sterling Holloway. Sterling has been in a number of other um, Disney uh, projects. He was he was the voice of Winnie the Pooh for a, uh, for a few of the uh, shorts for um, right. So right. So here we go. Uh, so he was. Uh, bear with me. He was, if I could find it, uh, he was Adult Flower in uh, Bambi. He was Mr. Stork in Dumbo. He was Professor Holloway in The Three Caballeros. The narrator of the Peter and the Wolf segment in Make Mine Music. Um, he was the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland. And he was also Roquefoot in The Aristocats. So Sterling Holloway does have a very... Uh, extensive resume as far as his Disney work is concerned. And the Trust in Me song at this point in the film is very unsettling from not just the lyrics, but also the music in the background as well, which definitely adds to that sense of um, hypnosis that he puts Mowgli under, uh, not just here, but also earlier in the film. Uh, manages to get Mowgli to sleep, and uh, we end up we end up with another running gag throughout um, through, through this film. Albeit it's only the second time it's been used, but um, Mowgli manages to uh, escape from uh, Car's uh, coils, and the, you'll see just somewhat over exaggerated with how um, with how Car falls from. Uh, the tree ends up in a ends up in a pile, and then uh, the the sound design is pretty hilarious here. Uh, he ends up with uh, his tail in a knot at the bottom of a tree. The tree breaks, and then he ends up just like squat, being uh, squashed together uh, like an accordion, if you will. Uh, Beggarly, I mean. Still trying to work out how he managed to get that not untied, but um, I can only use... <laughs> I'm still trying to work out how he managed to get that not untied, but nevertheless, uh, yeah. 
So we get to the climax of the film. So, so we've got about 10, 15 minutes left of the film. Uh, we're at the climax here where you've got the vultures who, interestingly enough, folks, were going to be voiced by the Beatles. Yep. George Harrison, Paul McCartney, John Lennon, and Ringo Starr were, gonna, were originally going to be the voices of the vultures. But, um, but they declined the role, so they ended up you know, they ended up with uh, Digby Wolf as Ziggy, who, who is one of the uh, vultures. You've got Chad Stewart as Flaps, and you've got Lord Tim Hudson as Dizzy. Uh, so there's definitely another I see there was definitely four vultures. So bear with me. Uh, yeah, Jay Pat O'Malley also does Buzzy. So there we go. There's so there we go. There's your four vultures. They see Mowgli. They make they want to make him an honorary vulture, even though A, Mowgli's not a vulture, and B, he doesn't have any feathers. But they end up with um, they end up with a song that effectively sounds like a barbershop quartet with That's What Friends Are For. And it's interrupted at the end by none other than Shere Khan because he sees the vultures, but the main person he's after is Mowgli. So he congratulates them. Bravo, an extraordinary performance. Now, I've tried singing, the, I've tried singing Shere Khan, Khan's part of That's What Friends Are For, but that very low note at the end of the song, I can't hit that unless I go an octave higher. That's really, I mean, don't get me wrong. I do, I do have, I do feel I've got a strong vocal range, but as I, even somebody who's been singing for a long time, like myself, even I can't hit that low note unless you're like a proper bass singer in a choir. And me, I'm sort of like high, sort of like mixed between baritone and tenor. But nevertheless, we get to, we get to the, the battle between Shere Khan and Mowgli, Mowgli standing up to Shere Khan, but uh, oh boy, <laughs> uh, yeah, the strings at this point uh, add to the tension of Shere Khan counting to ten, making the chase more exciting for him. And, I was like, and then you've got, and then you've got those little brass music stings with every number that Shere Khan is counting. And then he's just like, okay, you know what? Screw this. You're trying my patience. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Boom. And then Baloo grabs his tail and then the battle begins there. But Baloo, but uh, Mowgli, in there. Shere Khan, interestingly, uh, for the first part of the fight is focusing mainly on trying to get Baloo off his tail and then decides, right, you know what? After Mowgli is just like bashing Shere Khan with a stick, not sure how much that's going to help. Uh, decide, right, let's just chase him. With Baloo still holding on to the tail, mind. And then vul the vultures come in to try and uh, help in some capacity. Uh, and towards the end, um, towards the end, we end up with uh, a bolt of lightning striking a tree. And, there, and, that's, and that gets us the fire, which is what Shere Khan is actually scared of, which is, in, which is actually foreshadowed in... Uh, a couple of the lyrics from I Want to Be Like You, referring to Man's Red Fire. Uh, uh, not Man's Red Flower or whatever. I might be wrong on the lyrics, folks, so bear with me. Uh, that's it. If, I, if I had a bit more time on my hands, I'd be able to go into a bit more detail regarding all of this. But uh, I've only got about 20 minutes left. But uh, thankfully, we're nearly at the end of uh, the film. Shere Khan lands one huge claw strike to Baloo's face. And yeah, at that point, we think, yep, Baloo is out for the count. But uh, a few minutes later, we find out it could potentially be a lot worse. Um, but Mowgli manages to tie the branch, uh, the fiery branch on uh, Shere Khan's tail. And just the look on Shere Khan's face face when he sees the fire is somewhat comedically priceless and it ties into a line one of the vultures says uh, that Shere Khan's a real pussycat and then one of them responds look behind you chum and then it's, it's just the face at that point you're just like yeah 
<laughs> but um, it was like. And then Shikar is just he's just running off with the branch still tied to his tail, mind you. And then and then uh, and then the rain starts falling. And um the the vultures are gonna start celebrating, but then they re, the, but then but then old up for old up lads, now is not the now's not the time for celebrating. And this is the point where we think, yeah, Baloo's dead. And that's and this is like one of the one of only a handful of times throughout Disney's history that we see we see this happening that we think we think one of the comed, uh, we think one of the uh, the side characters is um, has been killed, but it turns out turns out they're actually uh, okay. But um, yeah, I was, I was, I, another another little another little fun note I put in here was. Uh, uh, and cue the uh, dot dot dot, and then Baloo's just like, uh, I was like, hey, I was just enjoying it. Sure, hey, tell us more about it. And then Bagheera's line at this point pretty much sums up my react, sums up my sums up my reaction in the notes. Why you big fraud, you? And I was, I was like, how I actually typed it in my notes here is like, and cue the, I was gonna say, and cue the cue the waterworks, but instead it ends up being cue the wait, what? He's still alive. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, we get to the end of the film with the um, with the last song uh, of the film. I'll just quickly go into the uh, soundtrack. Yes, uh, "My Own Home" is the name of the song because we end up seeing uh, who e so who ends up being the uh, effectively love interest of. One uh, Mowgli. Uh, she's she's singing about uh, going to get the um, going to get the water, but from the lyrics, she's got her future sorted. Uh, potentially marrying Mowgli, having their own family, and then uh, ha having having their uh, having their kids go to get uh, the water. Uh, and it's, it's just just a little. It's, it's, it's just a. It's how she um, uh, grabs Mowgli's attention at, at, at the end. Uh, now, either it's a prototype to winking, or she hasn't worked out how to wink at Mowgli yet. I don't know, but uh, we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, Mowgli and uh, Mowgli goes to the man village with her. And uh, there we go. Uh, Bagheera and Baloo finish off by singing The Bare Necessities as they walk off, or should I say dance off, into the sunset with The Bare Necessities in the background. And that is the end of the film. So, whew, not bad for summing up the film in about 30 minutes, folks. It is not very often I cover a film as quickly as that, but I feel I feel I managed to cover as much as I could given the uh, the time constraints that I had. So, so after after watching this, yeah, it is it is definitely easy to see why this is a this film is a very firm fan favorite. Not just for uh, not just for long time um, Disney fans, but also f but also for for us like introducing these older films to a younger generation, if you will. So now we get into the so now we get into the scores. Now the story I well I'll, 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 I'll try and sum this up as quickly as I can. Um, story through to the soundtrack. I gave all four of let's say the story, characters, visuals, and soundtrack. I gave all of those a nine. Um, let's say the story, it story. They did well with um, they did well with the source material, um, but uh, I, I said there were a couple of there were a couple of plot holes that I did point out in this review here and there, so that's like what stops it from uh, from getting a ten. Uh, the characters I felt like I felt they could have used a bit more time to explore the um, I felt they could have used a bit more time to explore the uh, bear with me. I felt they could have. I felt they could have used a bit more time to explore uh, the, uh, the wolf pack. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe maybe we could have had the wolf pack 
come and help in the uh, in, in the final battle. But um, not not really much we can do about not really much I can do about that. I say, uh, but I just felt they could have given the wolves a bit more um, uh, screen time. Uh, the visuals, let's say, was the visuals and soundtrack pretty much the same, pretty much the same issues as I brought up earlier. Is that as it was just, just there was a fair there was a fair chunk of recycling as far as uh, uh, the animation and, uh, and and some of the music as well. Uh, so, so, some of, so there was there were some parts of the the music score that were reused throughout uh, throughout the film, and I say, I say some of the some of the uh, some of the animation was. Um, Recycled not not just from uh, previous. Um, I say uh, there were a few chunks. There were a few chunks of animation that were recycled from previous Disney films, and uh, and like I say, some some of the sound some of the sound bites as well. Um, I say I say I was actually tempted to knock it down to an eight because of how much they did uh, with the recycling, but uh, I thought that would be a bit too harsh given how iconic this film is. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I say, but apart from that, great all round. The legacy of the film that's a ten. That's that is a no brainer. So why is the film a ten on the legacy front? So I'm just going to go into the legacy here. Uh, ah, clicked on the wrong one. There we go. Ah, legacy. There we go. That's what we're after. Uh, yeah, they've. There's been a lot to there's been a, there's a lot to go through here as far as the legacy of this film is concerned because, like I said, this was the first Disney film to um, be released after Di uh, Walt Disney himself had sadly passed away. But um, the the amount of support that this film got on its initial release was definitely a way to like definitely. I feel a way to say thank you to Disney for everything that he's done for the films he's done uh, previously. But um, let's see, uh, some of the other things that the this film um, this film has got uh, there was a couple of TV series for um, there was a couple of uh, there was a couple of other TV series for this uh, from this film uh, there was. There was Tailspin released, um, which was between 1990 and 1991, and then between 96 and 98, there was um, there was another there was another TV series, The Jungle Cubs, with The Jungle Cubs, which focused on the younger versions of Baloo, Hathi, Bagheera, Louis, Ka, and uh, Shere Khan. There was also a live action uh, adaptation in 1994. And there was a there was another director video there was a director video film in 1998 called The Jungle Book Mowgli's Story. There was a director video sequel in uh, the early two there was a director video sequel The Jungle Book Two released in uh, the early 2000s. We also had uh, uh, yeah 2003 that's when it was released. Uh, and then we've also uh, then we also had the uh, uh, the big Hollywood live action remake in 2016, which had uh, Bill Murray as Baloo. And we also had uh, Scarlett Johansson as Carr, uh, Christopher Walken as uh, King Louis. They did have the bare necessities and I want to be like you in the film, as far as the soundtrack was concerned. But, but the live action remake stuck closer to the source material it's it's a little bit darker than the animated version but it's still worth checking out it's definitely one of it's definitely one of the better live action remakes uh and don't worry folks i will get to the live action remakes eventually i've got this i've got this list of i've got this run of animated films to do i've also got the pixar films and then i'll get and then i've got the live action remakes to do so it's a long term this is a long term project this this series ain't going anywhere anytime soon if a disney film gets released you can guarantee it'll get covered in the kingdom of isolation at some point uh, there's also been a few video games uh, as well there was a, there was a plat there was a jungle book platformer on the um, super nintendo and uh, sega mega drive or the um, the Genesis or the uh, Sega Genesis for our friends over in uh, America. 
uh, there was a there was the Jungle Book Groove Party, which was uh, which was effectively uh, uh, which was effectively uh, Dance Dance Revolution or DDR to give it its uh, abbreviation. So, um, so, and then some of the characters also appeared in House of Mouse, Lion King One and a Half, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and Aladdin and the King of Thieves. And uh, some of the some of the Jungle some of the Jungle Book characters were also commissioned by uh, Greenpeace to help raise awareness of deforestation, um, in particular in like in particular in like the Amazon rainforest because that's like one of the biggest areas for the um, that's like one of the biggest areas as far as deforestation that is a major concern. So like I say, I say the I say the score here it's um. So the score here, it is a, for the legacy, it is a 10 out of 10, without a doubt. So taking all of that into account with the scores, and for Disney's first film since Walt Disney passed away, uh, it was only, uh, it was about 10 months after Disney had passed away, and I think this is a film that he definitely would have been very proud of. A score of 92%, which is a very, very, respectable score. So let's see where that puts it on our trusty leaderboard as far as the films covered are concerned. It slots in, uh, again, uh, taking into account the fact that I've uh, recorded these, these episodes out of order. Um, but from the episodes I've recorded, uh, well, but I, I actually, actually, I won't say what uh, the Black Cauldron got because uh, the Black because the Black Cauldron is one of the first is was the previous episode that I um, recorded, but that will be out until uh, 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 for another like couple of weeks or so. But uh, the Jungle Book got ninety two percent, so it slots in between Bambi and Cinderella. So. Firmly in the, so firmly in the top ten for the films that have been for the um, for the episodes that have been released um, so far. So, so yeah, uh, so we're, we're almost out of time here, folks. Uh, but yeah, so Alistair, what's uh, so Alistair, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a few I'm going to give you a few minutes before you finish up. So, what are you, what are your final thoughts on this film before we finish uh, before we wrap things up here? Um, well, obviously, like you said, it was um, Walt Disney. I think it was his, yeah, like you said, he, he passed away in the production of the film. So you didn't get to see the final um, say in it. But I'm, I was just watching in preparation for this, a bit of a documentary about the production of it. And uh -huh. he kind of took, after the Saw on the Stone, it received a bit of a lukewarm reception, the Saw on the Stone. Mm -hmm. So he kind of took a lot of control of the, uh, of the production of the Jungle Book. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, so the Sherman brothers, obviously, they took over the score, but originally the person who was taking over the score, they got rid of all of his songs apart from Bare Necessities. So they kept that from the old, mm. the old score composer, which obviously was the most famous song from the whole production. So yeah. it kind of shows how, you know, through little things, like little differences, how we could have missed out on such a hidden gem of Bare Necessities as a song. So um yeah, it kind of shows how um yeah, I guess how small and intricate things can be that can have like a long consequence in, in the film industry. So um we're grateful that they decided to keep that song in. Oh, we would, would have missed out on such a great iconic song. Yeah. So yeah, and um and I mean of course I say it's um and, and of course this this is one we definitely highly recommend uh showing to the showing to the uh, the younger. Uh, generation and uh, because I mean the younger generation will have no doubt seen the um the, the, uh, the, the younger generation will have no doubt seen uh, the live action remake which came out in uh, 2016 but they may not have seen the 1967 animated classic so um that being said I, say, I, I would definitely strongly I, I think between the two of us we would strongly recommend showing the younger generation um uh, the animated uh version of 
of the film. And then, and, and hey, who knows? Maybe the youngsters might end up making some comparisons between the two. But, um, but yeah, you'll say. I, I know. I know. There's gonna be. I know there's gonna be viewers out there that are gonna be like, "Hey, why didn't you give Alistair more screen time? Why didn't you get? Why didn't you let him have more input in the film?" Yeah, time constraints, folks. That's the only reason. But um, which, um, which I, th which I think, uh, taking that into account, I think we might need to do this on like a, a different day of the week, uh, so that way we can get a bit more time, so that way we can both have like more time. So, so, like, so, so that way you can get a bit more time to give your thoughts on like each um, each part of the, the films. But but don't worry, I'll make don't worry, I'll make sure I'll make sure I rectify that when we get round to uh, Aladdin with uh, you and uh, Beth. As a like, uh, great Instagram post earlier today, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it yes uh, yes uh, Ali and Beth are uh, are an item. So so I, so I thought. It makes perfect sense to have them like to have them like on board for um let's say it's let's say the, it, i'm pretty sure that i'm pretty sure this will be like the first uh episode of the king of isolation that i have two guests in the king of isolation wow. but uh we'll cross that bridge when we get to it but uh but yeah that being yeah that being said um I say that. That being said, um, I say Ali, th thanks for joining me for this uh, episode there, uh, time, time, time constraints and all. And I'm very much looking forward to having you and Beth on board when we get to Aladdin in the Renaissance period. That'll so. be brilliant. No, thanks, Fraser. Yeah. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. I say, but yeah, um, I, say, I, I know this. I know this episode was like somewhat rushed, folks. But uh, I, I am still. I am still going to put a fair chunk of time in getting this edited uh together to make sure to get like the, um, to get clips from the film this that and the other but um in the meantime hope you guys enjoyed uh, this um latest episode of the king of isolation uh, if you did hit the thumbs up and if you want to be dream chasers like us hit the subscribe button down at the bottom click the bell to join the dream chasers notification squad so you don't miss anything that we do on this channel the next episode is gonna be the aristocats and i'm gonna have my mum on board for the first time since the world war ii era with the three caballeros that's the last episode that me and my mum did together but the film involves cats alongside oliver and company so i was somewhat contractually obligated to make sure that i had my mum on board for the aristocats and oliver and company but uh yeah until then we will see you guys next time in the kingdom of isolation